Hey guys, how's it going? Jay here once again with another tutorial series. And this time I'm excited to finally bring you a series on CentOS. You guys have been asking for this one for a while, so I'm happy to finally be able to deliver this to you. In this series, we're going to focus, just like the name implies, on CentOS. And I'm going to show you everything from the installation to managing services and all kinds of things. I can't wait to dive right in. So in this first video, I'm basically just going to show you how to install CentOS. If you already have CentOS installed, feel free to check out the next video where we'll get started. Now in my case, what I'm going to do is actually use this laptop right here as a CentOS machine. Now most of the time you would use CentOS on a server. Some people actually do use it on laptops and desktops, but its primary focus is server. But I'm going to be using this laptop as basically a stand-in server to show you the process. I'm going to install CentOS on the actual hard drive, no virtual machine. It's going to be on the metal, on this laptop right here, and then you'll see the entire process from start to finish. Now, if you want to get up and running even quicker, feel free to check out my sponsor, Linode. On their platform, you can set up your own CentOS server in minutes. With the offer code LEARNLINUX19, you'll get $20 in credit toward your new Linode account That'll be more than enough for you to get through the content in this series. Now, whether you set up CentOS on a laptop, a desktop, a physical server, a virtual machine, a Linode instance, you'll basically be all set and ready to go so long as you have CentOS installed on something. And again, I'm going to show you on this laptop so that way you could see the entire installation process. So let's go ahead and dive in. Okay, so here we are on my laptop, and currently I am running Ubuntu, but shortly I'll be restarting this so that I can wipe the drive and dedicate it to CentOS. But before you can install CentOS, you need to download it. So first of all, just go to whatever browser is your browser of choice. And then in the address bar, you can simply go to this URL right here. The text is too small for you to see it. I will have that in the description below, but essentially it's just centos.org slash download. So let's go there and then we'll have an option to download it. So first of all, what we're going to do is download this right here, CentOS Linux DVD ISO. So I'll go ahead and click on that. And you can see we have quite a few links here. So CentOS is distributed as an ISO image. And as you can see, each of these URLs end with .iso. It doesn't really matter which one you click on. These are just mirrors. That's how CentOS is distributed. There's mirrors all over the place, so you can find a mirror close to you, which should help with the download speed. Now your page will look a little bit different because it's trying to find mirrors that are closer to you. Now in my case, in Michigan, it's actually showing me that these are the download links for mirrors closer to me and you could click on any one of those. So for example, I'll click on the first one, and as you can see, it wants to download an ISO file. So make sure you choose the option to save the file, and as you can see, it's a really large file, 6.6 .6 gigabytes. So go ahead and download that, and then go grab a snack, make some coffee, something like that, and then come on back and we'll get started. So what can you do with an ISO image? Well, if you didn't already know, an ISO image is an exact copy of a CD or a DVD that you can use to create a bootable DVD or a bootable flash drive. Nowadays, it's not really all that practical to create a bootable DVD, especially in this case, considering that the CentOS download is a whopping 6.6 .6 gigabytes. So basically, my preference is to create a bootable flash drive. However, if you have an older server that isn't able to boot from USB media, you might not really have a choice. Maybe you'll need to create a bootable DVD, in which case you'll probably need a dual layer DVD for CentOS, considering how large this ISO file is. If you don't already know how to create a bootable flash drive, I have a video on my channel already. I'll put the card up here. And there you'll find a walkthrough on using Etcher, my favorite utility, for creating a bootable flash drive from a Linux ISO image. And the process works fine on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux as well. So one utility will get the job done on multiple different platforms. Now, in my case, I've already gone through the trouble of creating my bootable flash drive. So I'm just going to go ahead and plug this in. 
to the computer. And I'm going to reboot into the CentOS installer. So basically, I just hit the F7 key here to activate the boot menu. It's different from one computer to the next. And then I will boot from my flash drive, which in my case is the second option you see right here. Now, we get two options right here. The first one is to install CentOS. And the second one is to test the media and then install CentOS. Now, basically, I recommend the second option. If there was ever any problem during the process of creating your bootable media, then you might run into problems. It's usually a good idea to test the media first, but to save time for the recording of this video, I'm just going to skip the test and go straight into the installation. And here we have the first screen that will appear during the installation process. At this screen right here, it's basically just asking you to select a language for the installation process itself. If your primary language is something else, just go ahead and choose that. Mine defaulted to English, so I'll go ahead and continue. Now, we have several different screens we can go into to customize various things. We should go into each of these, and for the most part, you don't have to do this in any particular order, but one exception is networking. You generally should do that first. Now, first of all, on the left side, we have the keyboard layout and the language support. I'm going to leave those as default. You can go ahead and just change those if you need to. Now, some of these things do require network access, so let's go ahead and do that first. So I'll click on that. And for some reason that I just can't understand, CentOS defaults to disabling networking, which, you know, the point of a server is usually to serve something, and that's hard to do without networking, but it's easy to turn on. We simply go over here, and then we turn it on. We simply click on it, and now the network is connected. We can also click on Configure right here if we need to change advanced settings, for example, setting a static IP. If that's something you need to do on your end, you could just go over here to IPv4 settings. You could change this over to manual, click add, and then type in whatever your IP address is that it should be. I just made up something random. Subnet mask, gateways generally required. in addition, a DNS server. Now I just put random values in there, but you get the idea. I'm going to change it back to automatic. So I'll click cancel because I don't want to actually save anything. As you can see here, I already have an IP address assigned, so I'm good to go. Another thing that I do recommend that you configure is the host name, which you see down here on the bottom left corner. I'm just going to name mine CentOS which you can barely see on account of the small text size here. But basically, just name your computer, server, whatever it is, to whatever name makes sense for its purpose. So that way it can be distinguished from other resources on your network. I'll apply this change, and then I'll click Done. Now, with that out of the way, we can go ahead and configure other items here. You can knock out the time and date settings, for example. And here you'll get basically a world map. And by clicking on the map, you can basically put this little dot, it's really hard to see, somewhere close to where you are located geographically. Now in my case, it was already pretty much correct. It auto-detected my time zone, and that's effectively what this is doing, is setting your time zone. On the upper right corner, you have network time. It's now on. It actually defaults to being off. And if it is off, I recommend that you turn it on. In my case, it looks like it got enabled when I activated the network connection. And if you try to enable this before you set up networking, it won't let you. But at least for this, we should be good to go, so I'll click Done. Installation source we'll leave alone. Let's go to Software Selection. Now the default option is Server with GUI. For the most part, most people will choose minimal install when they set up a CentOS server. A minimal install will not have any graphical utilities at all, and you'll manage your system completely by command line. Now in my case, I am running on a laptop, so I'm going to just leave it as server with GUI. 
There's other options on the right hand side that you can choose if you want, but I'm not going to go over those items and anything we do go over that matches any one of these categories, we are going to do by setting up manually so that way you'll learn the process. So I'll save this. Installation destination, we do need to configure that. In my case, I'm going to wipe out the entire hard drive. If you are following along with me, then I highly recommend you have a backup because this process is destructive. We literally are going to wipe the drive. If this is a server or a virtual machine, I mean, I'm sure you already are aware of that, but I do need to give out that disclaimer. Now, in my case, it's already selected the right hard drive. Well, I only have one anyway. So if you have multiple hard drives in your computer or server, make sure the check mark is on the correct one. I'm going to leave the configuration to automatic. If you want to do custom partitioning, feel free, but I'm not going to go over that in this series. And optionally, you can do full disk encryption if you'd like. If your server or workstation or whatever it is might potentially house very proprietary or private data, you might want to consider enabling this, but I'm going to leave it unchecked for simplicity for the sake of recording the series. So I'll click Done. And right away, it's going to realize that, well, this hard drive is not empty. And we don't have any available space to install CentOS. So what I'm going to do is click Reclaim Space right here. And then I'm going to click Delete All. Now I will Reclaim Space. And that should satisfy the requirements for that option. For the K-Dump option right here, I'm actually going to disable this. Now, whether or not you keep this enabled just depends on the use case. If it's a testing server, you don't really need this. It's just going to waste space. But if you are running on a production server, you probably do want to have this enabled. As a general rule of thumb, whether or not you have this enabled just depends on the use case. If this is just a test server and you are testing a specific application, there might not really be a real good reason to have this enabled. And then if it's a production server, you probably do want to have this enabled. Although on a test server, it could be possible that a crash dump could be helpful if your application runs into a problem. But for me, I'm just going to keep that disabled because I'm just recording a tutorial series. I'm not actually running anything important. So I'll go ahead and click on Done. And then I'm going to begin the installation. Now we need to set a root password, so I'll go ahead and click on that. I'll type it in right now, and again here. On a production server, you definitely want a strong password. This is just a testing installation, so I really don't care. But if the password shows as weak, you have to click Done twice. And then I'll go ahead and create a user for myself. And I'll just keep it simple here. And then I will make myself an administrator. I recommend you do the same thing. And then again, I need to type a password. Again, I don't care that it's weak. I definitely hope that yours is better than mine. And then I'll click done twice since it is a weak password. Now we should be all set to go. We're simply waiting for the installation to finish. Well, all right, awesome. It looks like we have a successful installation. So I'll click on reboot. Let's see if it works. So I'll go ahead and click on this licensing option right here. And honestly, I think this might be the simplest end user license agreement that I've ever seen when I was installing an operating system. But anyway, I'll go ahead and accept it. Why not? And done. Finish the configuration. All right, so I have the login screen. But I'll click on my username and then I'll type in my super secret weak password here. And now we have a successful installation, as you can see right here. Since I'm on the GUI version here, I can basically just go through this little welcome screen. Everything here is pretty self explanatory. And I'm going to go ahead and connect to Wi Fi to make everything easier on myself. So, anyway, I'll click on mine and then put in the super secret password. Connect. 
and it looks like it went through, so good. So for location services, that's a desktop Linux thing. For things like maps and things like that, I'll just leave that as default. Now I'm going to skip this, but if you are using this on a desktop or laptop, you might find some value in signing into one of these services if that applies to you. And we should be good to go. If you are new to the GNOME desktop, you could basically check out this helpful information right here, which will show you how to use it. And we should be good to go. So there you go. We have successfully installed CentOS and we're ready to go for the rest of the videos in this series. Now I'll see you in the next video as soon as I have it uploaded where I will show you additional commands. So I'll see you there.